I'm going to be looking at the book of Judges. And as you probably know, I've done did an overview on the book of Judges and an outline for the book of Judges. So if you want, if you want further uh, study on it, go look at those two videos. But this is the book of Judges, and we're just going to look at really what can we learn from each of these judges. What should we do like them? What, what should we do to not do like them in many ways? But it's got 21 chapters, 618 verses, and around 18,976 words. The author, Samuel. Historical time, 1425 B.C. to 1120 B.C. Uh, Judges shows the law of human collapse. A man isn't getting better and better. He actually gets worse and worse. Historically, what's the historical application? Israel fails to eliminate the enemies of God in chapter 1, so the consequence is that their enemies will be thorns in their side. God has to keep raising up enemies against them. When the enemy comes against them, they cry out to the Lord, and he raises up a judge or deliverer. And that is why it is called judges. There are 13 judges that God raises up. One of them really raises himself up. And devotionally, how can we apply it to ourselves? If we stray from the Lord, he will allow men to raise up against us, whether that be in the workplace whether that be in the ministry, whether it be at church, or wherever else. Why is it important to have a King James Bible? We find that out. Because when men don't have a final authority, they do whatever is right in their own eyes. This is why Judges is such a crazy book. This is why the world is a crazy place in 2021, because men are doing what they feel is right in their own eyes. They don't have a final authority in the King James Bible, they've disregarded the King James Bible. They want to do what's right in their own mind. And that's what they were doing in the book of Judges. That's why it's such a strange book. And that's why you live in such a strange world. In Judges 17, 6, it says, In, the, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. When you don't have the King James Bible, you're going to do what's right in your own eyes. In Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And when you use the new versions, uh, you'll become your own final authority at times that way. Because if, if one version doesn't suit what you want to say, you'll go to this version. And find the best version that suits what you have, what you want to say. But if you've got the King James Bible and you operate by that, you have a final authority. Now, doctrinally, you, you will see pictures of things that are going to happen in the tribulation and the second coming. And something else about the book of Judges is it's got 21 chapters, but it ends really with chapter 16 and 17 through 21 take place sometime within those first 16 chapters. And something else interesting is the book of Ruth also takes place during those first 16 chapters of the book of Judges. So, Judges 2.16, if you want to look at that, it says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. So, each time that Israel would cry to the Lord because he had to raise up an enemy against them, they would cry to the Lord and he would uh, feel sorrow for them and raise up a judge. So, what strengths can we take from these judges? Well, first, the first one is Othniel in Judges chapter 3. Israel is delivered into the hand of the king of Mesopotamia, so the Lord raises up the first judge, Othniel, the younger brother of Caleb. In Judges 3, 10 through 11, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel, and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cush, Cushan Rishatham. And the land had rest forty years, and Othniel the son of Kenaz died. So what is something you need that Othniel had? Well, you need the Spirit of the Lord to come upon you. 
And when you got saved, you were sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ephesians 1.13, In whom also ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. But you want to take it a step further and be filled with the Spirit. It says in Ephesians 5.18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. If I'm going to help the body of Christ, then I have to stay praying. I have to stay reading and studying and abstaining from evil. I don't want to do anything to quench the Spirit. I want to be completely full of the Spirit. Othniel uh, is very interesting because he pictures Jesus Christ. And one way he pictures Jesus Christ is his, he got his bride through a victory. In Judges 1, 12 through 13, it says, And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. So he got his bride through a victory. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says, But thanks be to God, which always which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Jesus Christ got his bride, the body of Christ, through a victory. So, that's the first judge, Othniel. The second judge, Ehud. After Othniel died, Israel forsook the Lord again. The Lord raises up Eglon, the king of Moab, against them. Israel cries to the Lord. The Lord sends them the deliverer Ehud. In Judges 3.15, it says, But when the, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And Judges 3.16, But Ehud made him a dagger with which had two edges of a cubit length. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a second errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could know, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. Then Ehud went forth through the porch, and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. So what can we take from Ehud? What did he bring with him? He had a sharp two-edged sword. He had a, a dagger with two edges. Me and you have a sharp two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wherever we go, no matter who we're going up against, we need to have the Bible and we need to have the Word of God written in our hearts. That's our sword with two edges. And this can picture a lot of things. It can picture you getting up and preaching and, and you're just you're beating people up with the Bible in, in a good way because, you know, you're, you, we use the Bible to repro reprove, rebuke, exhort, and it's going to make their dirt come out. It's going to expose their dirt. People's always wanting to dig up dirt on somebody. Just start quoting verses, and that's going to dig up everybody's dirt. Uh, Ehud stabbed Eglon in the gut with that dagger, and the dirt came out. So you need to have the word. You need to have your sharp sword with two edges. Take the sword of the word of God. Use it against the world. It exposes their dirt. Another thing about Ehud, be brave enough to give a present to the king. He, he went in there 
uh, on a, a mission into the king of Eglon. I mean, have some courage, be brave. In Joshua 1, 9, it says, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Okay, the next judge, Shamgar. In Judges 3, 31, it says, And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox gold, and he also delivered Israel. So this guy, Shamgar, has one verse here. And he killed 600 men with an ox goad, 600 of the enemies. Now, you know all about characters in the Bible like Zacchaeus and people like that, but how many of you have heard of Shamgar? That's because Christians over the years have forgot about these great books like the book of Judges, and they have no idea who Shamgar is. But he was a judge, and he killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. So what can we take from Shamgar? His weapon. Again, use what you have. Be content and ready to use what God's given you. All he had was an ox goat. He didn't even have a sharp two-edged dagger. So be content with what you have. Use the situation that God's put you in. Use the weapons God's given you. Use the, whatever material that God's given you and just do something with it. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Philippians 4, 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Shamgar could have said, I, I want a real weapon, or I'm not going to serve God. He could have said, uh, you know, you could say, Well, i got to have one of those nice, $150 leather Bibles. All I've got is this Dollar Tree Bible. You know, you know, just serve God anyway. Serve God with what you have. Now, judge number four, you got Deborah. Deborah and Barak. The Lord said to Barak to go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with them 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun. But notice Barak's response. Judges 4, 8, And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. So this is something we can learn from. But in this case, you learn what not to do. You see, Barak said to Deborah, If you'll go with me, then I'll go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. This is like, you know, teenage girls going to the bathroom or something. This is like, you know, teenagers that they can't go somewhere by themselves. They got to have somebody go with them. In Judges 4, 8, and Barak said unto her, If that will go with me, then I will go. But if that will not go with me, then I will not go. But this is after the Lord's done said he's going to go with him. There's something we can learn from this. Sometimes you have to be willing to walk alone with just you and God. God already said he's going to go with him. He doesn't need her to go with him. The true standout of this story to me, though, is a woman named Jael. There's a woman named Jael in Judges 4.17. And see, there's this guy named Sisera, and you know his he's the captain of of the host, and his his army's been defeated, and he's fleeing away. It says, "Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite." So Sisera is captain of the host, and he flees away to the wrong place. In Judges 4.18, it says, And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. Notice that she tells him to fear not. Jael tells Sisera, Come on in, fear not. And she covered him with a mantle. You see, in war, you use the art of deception. She's being very deceptive with Sisera, just like Rahab was very deceptive. She lied about the spies. Just like Joshua and Israel was deceptive when they went to defeat Ai. And she's going to be deceptive here. In Judges four nineteen through 21, it says, And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be, when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here that thou shalt say? No. Then Jael... Heber's wife took a, nail out of, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand 
and went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. What a story. Sisera is a picture of the Antichrist. As we talked about that the other day, if you watch that, the 18 types of Antichrist. And he gets a head wound, just like the Antichrist in Revelation 13. And Judges 4.22-24 through 24 says, And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin the king of Canaan until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So... Sisera pictures the Antichrist, he gets a head wound, Jael took the hammer and the nail, nailed it right in. What is that picture for us? Well, in Ecclesiastes, it talks about the hammer and the nail. Uh, the Bible talks about how it, it, his word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. What you need to do is you need to take the word of God, and nail stuff down in people's mind with it. You know, you, if somebody's got a question, always be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Take the word, be able to nail it down to them in their mind. The hammer and the nail pictures the word of God once again. That's what the, did you realize that the Bible's about the Bible? So many things in the Bible picture the Bible itself and always lead you back to it because the more you're in it, the better you are. That's why it says in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Take the hammer and the nail, your word of God. Get stuff nailed down in your mind so that you can get things nailed down in everybody else's mind. Now the fifth judge, Gideon. So Israel goes back into wickedness once again. An enemy comes up against them once again. They cry to the Lord once again. So the Lord calls Gideon. And notice a great characteristic we need to get from Gideon. He was humble. In Judges 6.15 it says, And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So he's poor and he's the least. And the Apostle Paul had a similar view of himself. He said in Ephesians 3, 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. So Paul saw himself as the least of all saints. Gideon saw himself as the least in his father's house. We need that humbleness in our life. Don't think that you're the greatest. Don't even be trying to be the greatest. Because Jesus is the greatest. He's the one that needs the glory and not you. It's not about you. It's about what God can do through you. And that's why it says in Judges 6, 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. He's like, it's good, you know, Gideon, you're humble and everything, but it's not about you anyway. Surely I will be with thee. And that's all you got to know. God doesn't need your strengths and abilities and talents the devil does. He wants your strengths and abilities and talents. God wants, God will use a weak man so that he can just shine even more through the weak man. So it's not about you. It's about what God can do through you. You don't have to be nothing because you are nothing. And if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself anyway. Judges 6, 25 through 27 says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock, in the ordered place, and take the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. So, I mean, he had a little bit of fear in him of fearing men, but he feared the Lord more and went ahead and did it anyway. 
what it, what the Lord wanted him to do was go down there and throw down the altar of Baal. His father was a Baal worshiper. He goes down there and throws down the altar of Baal and cuts down the grove that is by it and then uses the same material to build an altar for God. So that just reminds me, whatever talent or ability or material you have, if you are using it for the devil, take all that stuff and just start using it for the Lord. As long as it's not a sinful thing, you can use it for God. He tore that thing down and turned it into something that would give glory to God. And it made the people upset with him. They come back and they're all upset with him. And they want to kill him. Just like the world would do you. When you turn, try to turn things around, make, make it be something about God, they're upset because they don't want it to be about God. Remember, these men wanted to do what's right in their own eyes, just like people do today. They want to do what's right in their own eyes. They don't care about God in the Bible. But Gideon, he's a great character. And these are, just, these are just a few truths about each one. I want to get you interested in the book of Judges and make you get in it and dig in it yourself. And I go into more things in the Judges overview and, and in, the, in the outline. And then you got Judge number six, Abimelech. Abimelech is a murderer. He's the judge that pretty much made himself one. I mean, he, he just taught... Uh, I guess smooth talk people became a judge, but he also murdered people along the way. And Judges nine five, and he went to his father's house of Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbabel, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left, for he hid himself. He is so evil that his own people go against him. In Judges nine twenty two and twenty three, it says, when Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel. Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. So he eventually gets a head wound just like Sisera and the Antichrist. In Judges 9.53, it says, And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head, and all to break his skull. See, the, the Antichrist and all these types of the Antichrist just happen to get a head wound. And to top it off, he gets a head wound by a woman just like Sisera got a head wound by a woman. And the Bible says in Romans sixteen twenty, Paul talks about how Satan is going to be bruised under our feet shortly. You know that verse? I mean, we're the bride and we're going to be part of that bruising of the, of the serpent. So... This is pictures of a woman giving a head wound to a wicked man. That pictures the bride giving a head wound to the devil. And you see, Abimelech fought all these mighty men. Read Judges 9. He's fighting all these mighty men, just killing everybody. He's a killer. He's a bloody man. But then God uses something little to take him out. God's always using something little. God used Shamgar's ox goad. Uh, God used Gideon, the least of his father's house. Uh, God used that dagger to kill a mighty king of Eglon. I mean, he was probably slow because he was a fat man, it said. But he's using little things. The next guy, Tola, judge, the judge number seven, Tola. It says in Judges 10.1, And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel, Tola the son of Pua the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamer and Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shamer. So, there's not much about this guy. What can we learn from this guy? Well, he is the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. So, once again, it doesn't matter if you're the son of a Dodo bird. If you, if you are the son of a Dodo brain, maybe you got the dumbest dad in the world that never could teach you nothing, that raised you wrong, raised you to grow up and drink beer and live for the devil and chase women every night. You could be the son of a dodo and God could still use you. The next one, judge number eight, Jair. Judges 10, 3 through 5. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel 20 and 2 years. And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts. And they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Canaan. So, what can we learn from Jair? 
He made time even with 30 sons. Can you make time for the Lord with 30 sons? A lot of people aren't making time for the Lord with zero sons. A lot of people don't even take time for their sons, let alone time for the Lord. Uh, Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You may have responsibilities in life. You may have work. You may have children. You may have a wife. You may have to mow the yard all the time. You can make time for the Lord. Jair was a judge, but he had 30 sons. And I know back then, men probably didn't change diapers. They probably didn't give baths, and they do now in these days. But still, he had 30 sons, and he made time for the Lord. Judge number 9, Jephthah. In Judges 11.1, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. In Gilead beget Jephthah. So you can serve God no matter who your parents are. He was the son of an harlot. Nothing should hold you back. You can't just say, well, my parents are these people, and they didn't raise me right. Something we don't want to do in our life is... uh, just base everything on how we were raised. Well, I was raised this way, and just blame it on how you're raised all the time. There has to be a time when you decide, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to live for the Lord, because God says so, and it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing around you. Something else you you don't want to do is make a vow like Jephthah did. He should have trusted the Lord would help him in battle, even without making a crazy, stupid vow. But in Judges eleven thirty one through 34, it says, Then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So he's saying when he gets home, whatever comes out of his door first, he's offering it to the Lord. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them from Aror even Till thou come to Mineth, even twenty cities, and to the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. So he wanted God. He's like, God, if you will help me win this battle, whatever comes out of my house first, I'm going to sacrifice it to you. So what you have here, it's halfway a picture of the Father getting victory, the Father, God the Father getting victory through offering His one and only Son. Just a halfway picture. But what Jephthah did was not a good thing. Jephthah didn't know the Word of God too well, obviously. When he saw that it was his daughter was the first thing that came out, he could have just offered an offering to go back on the vow. Because it says in Leviticus 5, 4 through 6, Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats. For a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. So this sin of this evil thing that Jephthah did, he could have just not went through with it and offered an offering for that sin of such a a wicked oath that he did. In uh, Judges 12, you've got three more judges, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. Judges 12, 8 through 10. And after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel, and he had 30 sons and 30 daughters, whom he sent abroad and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. Then died Ibzan and was buried at Bethlehem. Does it ever cross your mind that one day you are going to die? Every saint, every king, every judge in the Bible dies. Then died Ibzan. I mean, he he did some good. It doesn't say much about him, but he died. You may be doing some good. You may think, well, God's going to keep me alive because I'm living for God. No, you could die tomorrow. Lester Roloff died. Um, He died early, pretty early. I mean, just he was in good health and everything and died in a 
helicopter crash or whatever it was. You're not promised another second. You won't live forever. Judges 12, 11 through 15, and after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel. And he judged Israel 10 years, and Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried in Ajalon in the country of Zebulon. And after him, Abdon, the son of Heliel, a Parathonite, judged Israel. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode on three score and ten ass colts, and he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon, the son of Heliel, the, the Pirathonite died and was buried in Pirathon in the land of Ephraim and the Mount of the Amalekites. These three men, their names are really hard to pronounce. Everything about their story is hard to pronounce. And there's not, not a big write-up about them. So what can we learn from them? Serve the Lord even if there's never a big write-up about you. The average Christian has never read this about these guys. They never will read it. If they did read it, they wouldn't know what it was saying. And if they did read it, they couldn't pronounce it. So, serve the Lord even if there is never a big write-up about you. Even if there's never anybody bragging about you. People may never give you credit. Just hope that God gets all the glory anyway. That's one thing I pray is, God help me to for my motives for everything I do for you to be about you and not about me and then I hope you get all the glory and never me get any glory that's what you ought to pray anyway I mean the more pu publicity you have anyway the more people can control you the more you'll be tempted of being controlled the more pu publicity you have the more you'll start cutting things that you say here and there anyway in Galatians 5.26, it says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory. In Proverbs 27.2, it says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Don't even worry about giving glory to yourself. Don't even worry about other people giving you glory or praising you. I mean, if you just go on serving God, other men will, will praise you somewhere. Other men praised, even though the world hated Jesus, he still had these men over here that loved him and praised him. Now, judge number 13, Samson. In Judges 14, 5 through 6, it says, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So right off, having secrecy from your parents is the be beginning of sorrow. I mean, you're going to go through some, some, some things in your life that you don't want your parents to know about. But the moment you start having secrets, from your, if there's young people listening to this, you don't want to start out your teenage life with secrets from your parents. It's only going to lead to trouble. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And notice it said he had nothing in his hand. Um, what can we get from this? We don't need any physical weapons. We have the Lord in his word. The spirit of the Lord came upon Samson when he was fighting this lion. I mean, you don't need physical weapons. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I don't have to have anything in my hand. I can go to the Lord in prayer, and and he'll, He can deliver me. It's not about the physical, bringing in a physical kingdom right now anyway. It's about a spiritual kingdom. We need to be praying to get people in. We need to be witnessing Using our the words of our, our mouth, that's our weapons. The King James Bible, we put it in our heart, and it comes right back out of our mouth. And that's how we get victory in this spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle like they were fighting back then. Now it's a spiritual battle. Judges 15, 4 through 5, And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corner of the Philistines and burn up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. 
So, I mean, this is a crazy story. Who knows about this story? Not many people. But Samson went and caught, he caught 300 foxes. He's a pretty mighty hunter to be able to catch, go and catch 300 foxes. I mean, it seems like he did it pretty fast. Maybe this is over time. I'm not sure. But he ties them tail to tail and burns up their fields with it. So, once again, God using little things. Samson using a little thing, a fox. And there's that verse that says the little foxes spoil the vines. Here it's Samson using little foxes to spoil the enemy. I mean, I don't even know what else you can say this. I just wanted to tell you because I thought it was a pretty cool story. In Judges fifteen fourteen, and when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loose from off his hands. So when you have the Spirit of the Lord, you know, they try to tie him up. But when you have the Spirit of the Lord, you don't have to stay in bondage. You can break, you break free from it. In Romans 8, 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So when you were unsaved, you were tied down with sin and death. When you, got un when you got saved, you're free. You can break free from that stuff. And then Judges 15, 15, and 16 says, And he found a new jawbone of an ass. And he put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, With the jawbone of an ass, heap upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. Once again, God can use something little like a jawbone of an ass to take down the enemy. Samson killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Not because of him. I mean, you're going to see later he loses his strength. So who was it giving him the strength all along? It was the Lord. And notice something else. He says, heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. He didn't give God the glory right away. Now look what happens. It says, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi. And he was sore thirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? So he's asking the Lord that. So he, he says, thou hast, thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. Now that he needs something, He's like, God, you did that, God. He should have gave God the glory right away. Don't wait until you're about to die of thirst before you say, God, you're the one that helped me all this time. You need to be giving God the glory through everything. Even the fact that you can get up out of bed and go to work every morning is something that you should give God the glory for. Judges sixteen nineteen through 20, And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. So Delilah here is uh, tricked Samson, and she got him to lay down. She cut, she cut his hair, and she says, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awake out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. So this shows me that Samson was so far away from God that he didn't even know that the Lord had departed from him. And it says in Judges sixteen twenty one, But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and, he, and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. So sin blinds and it binds and it grinds, as they say. First he's blinded, then he's binded, and, and, it, and it grinds on him. The way of transgressor is hard. Now look what happens in Judges sixteen twenty six through 29. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were... 
there were there upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand, and of the other with his left. So Samson... He's in between these two pillars. He's holding on to one with his left hand, one with his right hand. This picture is Jesus Christ down on the cross. When Jesus is on this cross, on the cross, he's got his hands spread out, arms spread out. In Judges 16.30, And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And Samson is put in the hall of faith for this. He made mistakes. He, he did some horrible things. But it's how you finish. Sometimes you don't do good in the first three quarters, but you did really good in the fourth quarter. He finished well. And it, it could have been better if he would have did good in all three quarters and then did legendary in the fourth quarter like he did here. But it doesn't always happen that way. And... Just like Jesus Christ, he triumphed over our enemies in his death. And this is another thing that shows you is suicide isn't an automatic ticket to hell, as many people say. You know, they say, well, what if a Christian commits suicide? What does that have to do with anything? He's killing his body. He can't kill his soul. And it, his soul sealed into the day of redemption. He's been spiritually circumcised. He's born again. He can't be unborn again. Suicide doesn't automatically put you in hell. But most people that are committing suicide also aren't doing it for the reason Samson did. The enemies he killed in his death was more than his entire life. But he had a legendary death. And he, Samson's put in the hall of faith for this. And he's probably the most famous judge out of all of them. But this was just a quick study through the book of Judges. I'm just trying to go through all the Bible, stay giving something different every week for people. And there's all kinds of stories through here that nobody knows about and that you need to familiarize yourself with. Go back and read the book of Judges. Listen to the, my overview of the book of Judges. Look at the outline for the book of Judges. Write it down in the front of the book.